you know, I'm going through all this anguish and blah, 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 and you're going to put me through. So I am just completely pissed off at this point. I'm just out of my mind frustrated. And I'm thinking, you just suck and I want to quit this. And he's like, yeah, that's okay. You can quit, but you signed a year commitment. So we'll continue to charge me. That took me over the wall and I'm just mad. And I end up our session early. I end up hanging up on him and I'm pissed and I'm ranting around the house and just mad and everything. And, you know, you know, you know how you, you go through all kinds of changes when you're off the phone and all the things you're going to do. I'm going to hire a lawyer and I'm going to do all this stupid stuff. And I get on the call the next week. And I'm still mad. I'm still just, I'm just like, you just don't understand. And, you know, I show up and blah, blah, blah. So what you do last week, you know, blah, blah, blah. I did the things I said I was going to do. I'm pissed. I, I did the things. And it took me like two weeks to realize all he was doing was exactly what I paid him to do, which was hold me accountable, do the things that I needed to do, even through rough spots, even through when life just sucked. Because, you know, going through a divorce just sucks. Yes. And he, he was doing his job to keep me honest and on track for my business to be successful and thrive. And it, like I said, it took me a couple of weeks to get over my frustration because at that time, five grand was a lot of money. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? So it was it was just like, oh, my God, five thousand dollars you took from me. But it was, you know, it was what I committed to. It's what I set out to do. And he was holding his part of the bargain. And uh, I will never, that was one of the best life lessons I ever had. Expensive, but a great life lesson for sure. So, wow. Yeah. Def awesome. Very different for sure. See, see, this is what I love about you. You know, there's a lot of coaches and a lot of brokers and stuff, but nobody digs in deep. And exactly says what made them to be who they are. So this is what I love about you. You just said it like it is. And you make me feel I am at the right place, right time. And I will get over this goddamn hurdle. And I am going to, um, me and Frank will be teaming up. And we're going to be, the, we're going to make this. It, we're going to be successful because I am not going to live poor. Absolutely. And that's it. And you know, the other Good school of thought, and this is for everybody, and I'm sure you guys already practice this. At the end of the day, it's only money, and you can always make more. It's only money. You can always make more. It's no, There's no finite amount of money. If you want it, it can happen. So, yeah, absolutely. Boy, I went through the same thing. And I was, we weren't married, but we were together for 10 years. And I walked out, left the house, went from one business to another. I went and I started, I went to school. I got my uh, appraisal license and I started doing appraisals and buying two cars in a house. The first check I got for doing appraisals was for a hundred dollars. Wow. You afford, what are you going to buy for the hundred dollars? It's a good right. thing I saved that money. But yeah, I went through all of that and all of a sudden came on on the other side. You, you know, that's the beauty of it. You know that you'll always come out of the other side. That's yep. it, right? Well, good afternoon, guys. I'm glad to have all of you here. Thank you for participating as always. I know last week we covered uh, a bit about objection handling, and I wanted to make sure that we kind of got into some of the topics uh, uh, that we talked about last week and were able to unpack them. I was looking at Jiro, my, my partner in crime is on this call. Jiro, uh, I forgot which one is my sh my chat button. I don't see my chat button on this. Um, we don't have the chat button quite yet. Oh, that's right. I, you know, I'm so used to, uh, that's right. My mistake. I, I was gonna share this with you. So what I'll do guys is I will share this on the screen. But last week we talked a bit about the thing that gives us all headache, right? Causes us all frustration is handling objections. And handling objections is one of the biggest things that we go through each and every time we meet with a new customer. Every single time we're handling some type of objection. Once our pit, once our scripts start to be really polished, we're able to include objection handling right in our scripts to where we can minimize or totally mitigate any opportunities people might have to object to what we, we may be sharing. But today what we're going to do is go over, um, and this is a very interactive presentation today, we're gonna go over the different types of objection handling that we do. Now, some of you are already doing these things, 
You just don't know that you're doing them or you don't know what they're called. And these aren't things that were created by me. These are things that have been in the sales realm and the sales lexicon for decades. I mean, since there were sales, these things have been around. Um, over time, I've learned, you know, pretty much every type of sales clothes. Um, I know specifically um, some of the tools that are utilized to elicit favorable responses. And these are the things that we're going to go over today. So let's get started. Does anybody have any questions before we actually dive right into this? No, sure. Okay. So um, I, I'll just go over the list of them right off the bat, and then we'll actually cover um, what each one does. Um, so the first one is uh, boomeranging. So we have boomeranging, objection chunking, conditional clothes, which we use all the time, curiosity, deflection, feel felt found, humor, justification, lark, layer, objection writing, preempting, pushback, reframing, renaming, re reprioritize, and plain and simply just writing. So as we talk about something like uh, the boomerang method. So the boomerang method is when people, um, uh, uh, when people object, turn them around by using what they said to prove that they're wrong, right? And this is something I do all the time. In our heads, information is processed differently than when it's externalized, either through words or through writing, things like that. There's, a, you know, part of your brain in the limbic region is uh, stimulates um, thought and creativity and language. And so when we actually write something down, in other words, something outside of our head uh, and then onto paper to where we can visually see it, the meaning or the subtlety changes a bit. So when we talk about boomeranging, that's literally taking someone's words and turning them around to where they can go, oh yeah, you're right, that doesn't make sense at all, right? Any, can anybody give me an example of a boomerang. Hmm. Uh, I don't want to buy because the prices are too high. Exactly. That's a perfect one. Yes, it's expensive, but I don't think you would want to buy your wife something cheap, right? Or your spouse, or I don't think you'd buy a, a cheap house for your family. That's taking the objection and turning it right around. Good, Frank. That's exactly it. Yeah, right. Or you don't want to wait two years and buy when you know and where you can't afford it now. Right. Or or or, or waiting two years. Uh, you want to wait to buy a house? Well, how much more do you think it's going to be in two years? Right. You know that yeah. it goes up. It's not going to go down. And Again, taking too. taking that objection and indeed turning it around. Another one would be like, um, you know. Uh, certainly if you don't have the money today, then we can arrange, you know, to kind of take care of it tomorrow, you know, pushing it off in a way that's, that was kind of a weak one, but um, you know, certainly the one about money's a very good project or if the house needs a little work, right? So Mr. And Mrs. Uh, buyer. So the house meets your needs in every way, but you feel that the condition uh, you know, is not quite right. So you're willing to pay more money to get less house things like that, right? Sometimes just a little TLC and everything needs TLC, including us as people, right? But, you know, properties as they start to age, no matter how good it is or how well maintained it is, at some point, it's going to need a little TLC. So helping them to realize that TLC is common and that they can absolutely benefit from TLC. In the real estate land, we call it sweat equity. Um, sometimes that's an ideal way to get somebody into a property that didn't think that they could actually afford the property. It's a little sweat equity. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if I found you a house that met all of the needs and all the criteria that you shared with me, but it needed a little work like paint, carpet, things like that, not heavyweight like uh, carpentry and electrical, um, would you be willing to purchase this property? And that's a way of reframing that objection or you know, uh, giving that objection back to them. So they're like, oh yeah, absolutely, carpet. because. You know, everybody knows how to paint. You know, even if you don't know how to paint, you know how to paint, right? One of the <laughs> probably simplest things we can do as a DIY project ourselves is is paint. Or you have a bunch of friends over and pizza and beer, and then you got a yep. paint party. So that's a good thing, right? Um, so by using the words that they say, um, you know, and you're giving it back to them, 
it allows them to associate with what's actually right in the scenario versus, you know, because again, if you keep in mind, all objections are 100% irrational, even money. And we'll get into that in a bit, but we've talked about that quite a bit. The next one is what's called objection chunking. Has anybody ever heard of that term or, you know, know how that works? No. Okay. So objection chunking is where you take a, a higher position. So it's what's called helicoptering or chunking up. It helps them to see the big picture a little bit more. So basically what you're doing is you're bundling a lot. So, you know, they'll, they'll give you an objection. And then that objection chunking, you're adding to it, which is, so Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, so what I hear you saying is the price is too high. Um, is, is the price too high to support you and your family over a 30-year period to where you can see them grow and develop in this house? You know, is, is the price too high to where you can start to realize equity in a normal basis is 2 and 5% every year? You start to add things to where now that objection is completely deflated, right? You're giving them so much data that that objection doesn't hold water any longer because the price is too high. It may feel like it's too high today, but we all know in the long term that that uh, property that you bought is only going to increase in value. Look at the people who bought a house in 2014 who were just we were just coming out of a, a, a recession, Right. Everybody was a little tenuous. You know, everybody was like yeah. poking their heads out of their cave. And it's like, yeah. now can, can we do it now? Can we do it now? Now you fast forward to 2021, 2022. How much equity or appreciation did those same buyers realize in just a six year period? A lot. Right. I mean, people who bought in 2014, you know, they backed up the Brinks truck. They were able to absolutely. um you know, uh, benefit from that purchase. And I guarantee all of those people in 2014 was, well, you know, the price is more than I want to spend or interest rates are a little higher than I'd like them to be. Because if I recall, interest rates in 2014 were six and a half or in some cases seven, uh, yeah. because we were just coming out of a recession. Banks were uh, very hesitant in terms of the lending process. They were just yeah. opening up their doors a bit. Lots of products had gone away. So this is a way of utilizing that objection chunking. We're basically drilling down to where we're giving them so much that they're going, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. All those things are true. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It It, it is going to go up, right? Um, you're getting them to look at the big picture or you're getting them to really expound on why they have that fear of, let's say, money or something like that. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. yes. Okay. Um. This is one, my favorite, conditional close, because we use this all day, every day, right? We've been doing this since we were babies. We've been conditionally closing our entire lives. We just didn't know that's what we were doing, right? Think about when we were little and we wanted something and our parents said no, right? <laughs> Mom, dad, if I... Oh, I want it. I want it. Right. If if we couldn't frustrate them with our whining and our nagging, we go, OK, 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 mom, if I if I clean up my room for a week, can I have it or I, I will do. That's what's called a conditional close. If I do this, will you yeah. do this? That's a conditional yeah. close. And we have been doing this for a lifetime. Our children did it to us. And I'm sure our children's children are doing it to them. Right. Yeah, but boy. every everybody on the planet has done a conditional close. And we do it well. We've learned to master conditional closes. Um, like I said, we don't always know we do it, but we do it. So how does that apply in an environment like real estate in what we do for a living? Um, and how do we create structure um, to where um, it allows for someone to state an objection and for us to remove that objection? Can anybody give me an example of how we would... Um, Realign with a conditional close if somebody gave us an objection. Can anybody give me an example? Um, well, like if, if a buyer wants to buy a house and let's say there's X amount of stuff has to be done that comes back on an inspection and they're saying, well, you know, the house has those amount. I go, what happens if I get the seller to pitch in and help you pay for some of these things and give you credit 
and then you can hire whoever you'd like to hire to basically get it done the way you want. Perfect. Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, if I can get the seller to, to kick in and contribute on these repairs, can we still move forward? That's exactly it. Perfect. That was perfect, Marcella. That's Thank a you. great conditional close. It's one of those ones where if I do this, will you do this? It keeps people continually moving forward. They're able to kind of go, oh, yeah, okay, well, uh, sure, I'll do that. And that's why, that's why I say all the time, objections are irrational because there's always a way to mitigate any objection. It's just a matter of how we think through it, how we use it, and that's a perfect one. If I can get the seller to contribute to the cost of the repairs or give you a credit to, I love how you added to where you can hire anybody you want, you know, would you be willing to move forward? Because nine times out of 10, we know our buyers do what with that money? Keep it. <laughs> right? They're yeah. like, you can go over to anybody's house, any one of your customer's house that you bought or you helped them buy something last year. And the thing they said they were going to fix, you're like, oh, I see you didn't fix this thing. Yeah, I'm going to get to it. I just couldn't find anybody I liked. So, you know, that money's long spent. So, yeah. but we don't care because it met their yeah. needs. We were able to, um, you know, help them to overcome what their true fear was, which was they threw up a roadblock in an irrational roadblock so that they could get more information um, on its resolution. And that's what's called the exchange principle. It's, it's basically a type of social agreement. And like I said, we have been doing this our entire lives. We have literally done this even since birth. And I'll challenge that by saying even a baby. So we know that babies cry for different reasons, but because babies don't have the structural ability to speak, in other words, they don't have um, command of fine motor skills at a certain thing, but they're listening and they're taking in information. And because we don't always understand their cries, their cries are a form of language for them. You know, they're cry, ah! you know, cry because they're wet. They'll cry because they're hungry. They'll cry because they're bored and need your attention. But that social alignment or that uh, that exchange principle happens is the minute you give a baby what he needs is a bottle. Next thing you know, that crying stops. I'm good to go. You know, no sirens for now. And I'm off to the next thing. You change my wet, poopy diaper. That's it's, it's a style of communication that uh, we all develop based on, uh, you know, based on how we exist as human beings. Um. The next objection style that we can talk about is curiosity. So curiosity is a big one, and we do this a lot. So a lot of us, we get frustrated, particularly when our buyers or sellers throw up these roadblocks that we don't always understand or that we're sometimes curious about or frustrated about is really a more truer statement for some of us as agents because we know that our Sellers can absolutely frustrate us. Our buyers 100% of the time can frustrate us if we allow them to. But when they declare that they don't want to do something with you like buying a house or, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to work with you even, act curious. You know, don't just ask why, which was a closed-ended question because why elicits a no or because or just because I don't want to. It doesn't allow for an opportunity for them to expand upon their thinking or their beliefs or what they're uh, going through at the time. Get curious. Go, huh, well, that's weird. God, w you don't want to work with me? What is, is it because of my face or you don't like that I'm too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny, too pretty, too ugly, too whatever? And it allows for that uh, expression to open up because you're providing a an element of humor, but that curiosity allows them to kind of really get at it. They could just be mad at you because you forgot to call at 11 and you called them at 11.05 and now you're into their favorite TV program or they're back at work or anything like that. But sometimes we don't communicate it well as human beings. So rather than state what's actually bothering us, we tend to... Um, we tend to act out and we act out in childish ways, unfortunately, through silence. And, you know, uh, I, well, I don't want to do this thing with you now because you pissed me off, but you won't say you're pissed off, you know? Um, so ways that we can, what are some ways that, or what are some examples of, um, you know, a, uh, handling the curiosity objection? Hmm. 
What's a type of curiosity objection? So one would be like, huh, well, gosh, I, I'm just wondering what changed your mind today? What, you know, what's going on with that? Yesterday we were, we were completely aligned and today it's different. What, I'm just wondering what changed your mind or what's different today, right? That curiosity way or, you know, what, what led you not to want to buy a house today? I mean, yesterday we were all on the same page. You were super excited about buying a house yesterday. What, what happened today? What's, what's different today? You know, and asking in a way to where it's genuine enough to where they feel like you actually care, right? Because sometimes you, you can ask in a way to where it's just like, oh, my God, why not? What's going on? Why, why don't you want to buy? Well, we've already committed to the seller verbally, right? Which is sends them further down a path of frustration and fear. We know that, you know, making a large purchase or a big life decision like buying a house is absolutely overwhelming. I don't care who you are, how many times you've purchased. It is absolutely a nerve wracking experience each and every time. Did I pay too much? Did I pay too little? Is the condition exactly what I want? What will I have to change in the near term? What are my taxes going to look like? Should I have bought in a better neighborhood? You know, we go through all kinds of things in our head, which prevent us from doing the things that we actually set out to do, rather than appreciating the fact of, I'm going to have a nice roof over my head for me and my family. You know, the neighborhood's going to appreciate all these kinds of things. Sometimes the way we use the curiosity objection handler is, you know, like I said, humorous. It's kind of a humorous thing. That's why I added, what, am I too fat, too skinny, too ugly, too pretty, too what? You know, and they, they start to see the humor and it allows them to relax. And it actually pulls more out of them. They're able to evoke at that point and go, yeah, you know, I don't know, D, I was just pissed off at you because... You know, the last six times we've been out, you know, you said we were going to look at single family houses or one stories. And, you know, we've looked at all these two stories and, you know, I'm not feeling heard by you. Right. It could be something like that to where you can say, I know that. But, you know, the reason why I've shown you two stories in addition to the one stories we've looked at is because based on your criteria, I felt that these things might align with what you're looking for. You know, just it gives us opportunities to kind of clear the air, so to speak, and make them feel more whole or that they, they or that they feel heard by you. Does that make sense? Yes. Can I can I throw in a little story here? Absolutely. When I, when I first started uh, my uh, uh, training as an appraiser, uh -huh. the first place my boss took me to, he says, I'm going to let you take all the notes and tell me what this house is worth. I said, okay. So we go off into uh, to Sydney, Florida, and something I had never seen in Kissimmee, we have to go through all these, you know, around bends and stuff and woods, and you get to it, it's a castle. Oh, wow. It was a guy built it because he wanted, always wanted to have a castle, and that was the only place where the county would let him build whatever he wanted. And I looked at Dale, I said, Dale, how am I supposed to compare this to anything else? He goes, that's what you're going to get every so often, so you better learn to do it. Oh, my wow. God. That, that was something different. I mean, there was, that was the only castle in the whole, I don't think the whole state, but, you know, it was. It was that is wild. wild. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. I mean, we run across those kind of scenarios where we're just going, oh, my God. So, yeah. How that's a good one. This? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. How am I going to compare this? Let's see. Castle, castle, castle. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. That would be extremely frustrating. Yeah, it's it's not like well they had one sold six months ago. They, there's there isn't one in any, any place in Florida, but and it was just, just that one. guy really took his time to did it block by block. It was a it was a castle. You wow. see the, the the stones at the outside. It was beautiful. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, those one offs. All you can do is what a cost approach on that thing, right? Uh, that was part of it, and we just kind of compared it to other homes because they're the same function. They served the same function there, and we took into consideration what he paid to have it done compared to other houses. What right. We thought it's uh, life expectancy was, so we kind of worked around it to come up with the value. Got it. Got it. That makes sense, right? I mean, you got to figure it out. I mean, there's so many unusual properties that exist yeah. that very difficult to kind of term them as what they are. It's like, oh, you know, that's what that's one of those objections that we get all the time 
Well, my house is X. It's right. just like when you see a McMansion in a neighborhood full of nothing but old 50 style flat tops and they're right. going, but my house is worth X, right? It would be worth X if it was in a neighborhood that had a lot of X's in it. But this neighborhood yep. has nothing but Y's and Z's, right? Yep. So, you know, that's what's called uh, progression is like it's worth more if it's around houses that are worth more. It's worth or regression is it's worth less. If, if you got the best house on the block and everything else sells for 700000 and you feel yours is worth a million, yours is only going to be worth 700000 yep. So yep. that's good. Good example. Good example. Um, another... Um, Another uh, objection handler that we sometimes use, and again, one of those things that we've done for a lifetime, we just probably didn't know what it was called or you know how we use it on a daily basis, is something called deflection. So deflection, we do this all the time. I mean, we do this with friends and family. We just simply avoid answering it right then and there. And part of the reason being is because it allows people to hear the rest of what you want to say. And then um, you may very well answer what it is that they started to object to in the very beginning, right? Um, you know, when we try and answer each and every little hurdle or little roadblock that comes up when we're having a conversation or we're doing a presentation with someone, we get stuck, right? The biggest one that happens is um, negotiating commission. That's one of the things that absolutely every agent goes through because they almost inevitably all do the same thing, which is the minute they say it, then they stop because they're ready for them to challenge why there is what it is. If you continue to move on, you know, it's not a big deal, right? But uh, agents make it a big deal, which allows for a, a seller to make it a big deal. But what are some examples of deflection? I can think of one right now. Um, you know, which would be, um, somebody says something about, um, I don't know anything, uh, the neighborhood. Hey, you know what? That's a good point. Let, let's cover that in a bit. So what I was saying was, and it just seamlessly rolls into, and when I said, I'm going to cover it, it doesn't mean I won't. It just simply means I'm not going to cover it right now. And again, I may have a way of addressing that same objection later on in what my presentation is or anything that I'm sharing. Like neighborhood's always a good one. Well, I heard that, hey, you know what? That's a good point. You know, I'll, let's talk about that in just a little bit or I'll cover that in a minute, things like that. Um, that's a good way. Another one would be, um, you know, I, I see what you mean. So, so anyway, as this house was X, so what you're doing is you're taking a moment to acknowledge that they said something to you but not necessarily that you're going to cover it right now. Jiro, can you think of any other examples that you've utilized uh, as a uh, deflection to handle a customer, either a buyer or a seller? I, 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 <clears throat> excuse me. I was having issues on muting. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Uh, the deflection is... Uh, Probably one of the trickier ones because deflection isn't something we necessarily practice, right, in our everyday life with friend, friends and stuff, just compared to the others I'm saying. Mm -hmm. but, but it could be something, something like, I understand you have a concern about the, let's just say, price. Um, so there's a couple of things you can do. You can either say, uh, uh, please give me a few moments and we are, we're going to cover that when we discuss X. Or you can say, I understand you have a concern about the price. Can we, um, assuming we can address your concern with the price. So this is, deflection is somewhere that I, for example, often will try a, a soft close, if you will, and say, uh -huh. if we can handle your price objections, is there anything else stopping you from moving forward with this purchase or with this sale if it's a right listing. what we call a trial close right yeah so i would do a trial close and a deflection at the same time mm -hmm. because uh, as as we all know for everyone whatever concern it is that they have in their mind that's the most important thing in the world right so deflection is one that i will tell you i don't use because i'm not an expert at uh d if you will but typically, See, I think you are, Jiro. I think we I, I think we absolutely use deflections all the time. I mean, 
think of your son sometimes, right? Sometimes he may ask you something, maybe not now, but when he was younger, you know, he, hey, dad, can we, can we, I don't know, having Donald's, I don't know, I can't think of anything. You right. know, son, maybe, I haven't thought about what we're going to do for dinner, but let's talk about it later, right? That's a, that's a style of deflection, which is he wants something now, but, it's not something you want to address right now and you put it off yeah. till later. And sometimes it resolves itself. Yes. Well, uh, okay. So I guess I hadn't considered that deflection when you put it that way. Yes. And, and absolutely. Uh, with any objection, the first thing we want to do obviously is we want to uh, confirm to them that we understand that they have mm -hmm. this particular concern. Sometimes mm -hmm. just saying you understand is enough of a deflection. Right. That's a great one, Jiro. Sometimes, hey, I understand. Oh, I hear you on that. Okay, oh, yeah, I get it. And then you just move on. Absolutely. Does that make sense, guys? Does it make sense, everyone? Yes. Yes. Okay. The other one, or the next one, that we do somewhat infrequently, but we do it, um, and it's a good tool to use when someone has a lot of anxiety about a particular action or behavior that they're trying to execute on, is we do what's called the feel, felt, found method. And the feel, felt, found method is really about providing um, empathy to a person in a way that still allows them to move, move forward. It creates harmony and rapport with that person. So an example of feel, felt, found, is let's take price for instance. You know, Mr. and Mr. Bu Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I understand exactly how you feel about price. Many of my clients have felt the same way you do that this market is absolutely crazy and they they feel a little scared about buying in this market. But what they've all found is that they, if they look at what their bottom line is and the reason why they're looking to purchase a house now, it allows them to move forward to fulfill some of their life goals. Does that make sense, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, which you close it up with a tie down. So many of my buyers have felt this, uh, many of my buyers feel the same way. They felt the same way that you do. And they found that by creating action, they were still able to achieve their goal, right? Feel, felt, found. That's one of those ones that if you're not sure on how to provide um, accuracy when you're giving someone empathy, this is a great way to do it because what it actually does is it puts them in the mindset that other people are experiencing the same things that I experience. I'm not alone. I'm not on an island to where, um, you know, I'm the only one who's ever gone through it. And again, behaviorally, we as human beings understand that if other people have experienced what we do, and by the way, there's I can't think of anything on the planet, I could be wrong, that, uh, that other humans haven't experienced. I, I don't think there's a singular human event that other people haven't felt. It's not isolated to one individual. Um, you know, it's the feel felt found is a great way to express empathy. Um, okay, I've talked a bit about this one, which is humor. I do this a lot, personally. I use humor all the time. Humor is a great rapport builder, just as long as you don't overdo it, right? Some I've seen uh, many agents over time, uh, because of their own discomfort, um, take humor and just go over the top to where they almost sound clownish or buffoonish with what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but it is absolutely that thing to where when we look at um, dealing with somebody who's frustrated, someone who's not, um, you know, uh, experiencing a, a positive uh, feeling in the journey of buying or selling. Sometimes we respond, we, well, we, sometimes we respond negatively because our own frustration kind of jumps into play and, you know, we, uh, we're matching their level of tension. Um, a way of diffusing tension is utilizing humor. Just like I said, when somebody said, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to work with you. What, am I too fat, too skinny, too ugly, too what? That's a level of humor, you know, self-deprecating humor that allows them to kind of go, oh my, oh, my, oh, my God, it's none of those things. And then it gives me a different perspective on how to address what that concern may be for them. Listen, I, I understand, right? We use a lot of these techniques like Jiro just did 
in um, you know in a bundle, right? We don't just use one objection handler solely at, a, at any given time. We use multiples all in the same thing. And humor is one of those ones that we frequently combine or pair with other objection handlers. So, like I said, you know, some ways of um, some ways of absolutely mitigating frustration is with humor. Oh, oh my God. Oh no. What are we going to do? Oh, you know, you laugh it through and then they kind of laugh it through and it makes them feel more comfortable. Um, or you say things, like I said, self-deprecating. What do you mean you don't want to work with me? Oh my God. Have I lost my touch? And you, you know, you kind of get animated about it. And again, giving the opportunity for them to kind of state why they may be frustrated with you or why there may be um, some friction or some difficulty um, absolutely works. Humor is a great way of doing what we call reframing, you know, in the situation. We take what it is and we're not going to accept what these emotions are. Essentially, we're going to package them up in a way to where everybody at the end of this feels comfortable. Um, and we're, we're getting away from the frustration and embarrassment. Another thing that happens when um, people are frustrated and angry is there's also a level of embarrassment that happens once they realize their anger was irrational, right? Um, when someone's anger has to be diffused, someone feels shame because they you know, behaved in a way that could be construed as childish. So by adding humor, it allows them to feel safe in the process you know, they don't feel like you're just kind of poking fun or, you know, treating them like the jerk of the day or anything like that. It's, you know, everybody had fun at this silly thing and we're able to move on and talk openly without uh, any difficulty around it. The, have you heard the New Jersey humorous objection handler? No, I haven't. Well, you know, you can list the house with me today or just call your insurance company and file a claim tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a good one. No, I haven't heard that, but I'll use it. <laughs> that's a good one. List with me today or file an insurance claim tomorrow. That's that's really funny. That's good. Um let's see. Another objection handler is um, justification. So um, rather than fight the objection, justify why it's reasonable. So, you know, a good way of looking at that is, you know, if they're complaining about price, um, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I understand that the price is expensive, but if you look at the neighborhood in which you're buying into, the quality of the property that we're buying, how the neighborhood appreciates the low crime rate, you know, the proximity to schools, all that good thing, wouldn't you acknowledge that that's a reasonably good uh, investment? And when you can get people to see, oh my God, yeah, absolutely, all of these things exist. Sure, you want to buy a, uh, uh, as, as Frank said, you want to buy a mansion for a starter home price? I don't think so. It's not going to happen, right? But if you point yeah. out all the features and benefits to the thing, that they're buying, oh my God, you're getting all these things. You know, I get it. Yes, the price is expensive, of course. What would you expect to pay for a house of this quality, right? It's got all this good stuff. I mean, sometimes when people buy a house, they don't realize the house is just the house. It's a structure, four walls, roofs, and doors. All houses are the same. Where houses start to differ are the features and amenities, right? You know, all those things that are um, you know, that make the house the house, marble floor, or tile flooring, you know, real nice wood, you know, things like that, upgraded appliances, all those things start to change the character of a house. I mean, you could take a, a dump, a low-end house and put nice features into it. And then all of a sudden that house becomes something. Oh, heck, I'd live here too. Right. So that's, that's how you get a buyer to understand why pricing may be what it is. Now, certainly in, in some of our markets or all of our markets, pretty much, you know, the way things are priced is just a, a condition of what the market is doing. So you can pay a million dollars for a dump in, in most of our markets or what we might perceive to be a dump. I, and the reason I retracted what I just said was I think we've all had the experience to where we've uh, inadvertently judged a property and that property 
um, and knowing that everybody lives somewhere, it's just a property that you yourself wouldn't live in. Um, you know, and that, that that's not a bad thing. It's just not my taste or not my style. You know, it's great for you. It's just not my taste. It's not what I'm looking for as I look to choose a lifestyle. But there's nothing wrong with you choosing that lifestyle for you. So let's see where we are on time. I'm going to cover a couple more, and then that'll leave us plenty of time for question and comments. So I'm going to go through the Lark layer method fairly quickly because this is fairly academic. I mean, it's one of those things that we also already know. So LARC is an acronym that stands for Listen, Acknowledge, Assess, Respond, and Confirm. So, uh, you know, Jiro says this all the time, which is uh, we have two ears for a reason, uh, two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to do more listening and less talking. And as agents, we do a lot of talking all the time. Sometimes we talk so much, we talk ourselves out of a sale because we didn't listen to what they're actually telling us and what they may want or need. So we want to listen first and, and avoid the temptation to jump in at the first opportunity we have. That way we understand what they're actually saying to us. Then we want to acknowledge that they said green or parroting. We give back to them what they said. So, you know, let me make sure I understood you, Marcella. So, you know, you're wanting to move right now because these things happened and you're really wanting to do the, you know, you give back to them what they gave you so that they know you heard them. You're acknowledging that. You're assessing what they heard to make sure that you don't have any questions to get further detail. And we almost always have um, further questions to get more detail. Um, like, for instance, when somebody says, I'm looking for a four-bedroom, three-bath house. Well, we know that a four-bedroom, three-bath house looks different for everybody. We want to know what they're in right now because then that gives us an idea of what they may be looking for. If they're in a little tiny apartment and they've never owned a property before and they say, well, I want something bigger. I'm looking for maybe four bedrooms and three baths. Well, what are you in right now? Well, approximately how big is that? Oh, it's 600 feet. So big to them, maybe 1,200 <laughs> square feet, right? At 30, you know, we go, we break our necks and we're finding them the biggest house we can find. And they're like, no, that's not that. Well, you said four bedrooms. Well, not that kind of four bedroom. So, I mean, we really want to understand what they have. And then we respond, right? Um, you know, which is that uh, objection handler that we use all the time. Then we have a full understanding of what they may be saying. That gives us an opportunity to respond and confirm that we can actually remedy or meet the condition. Um, so that's the LARC math method. And it's very similar to layer, LARC layer. Layer is listen, acknowledge, identify, and reverse the objection. And layer is used more specifically when the objection has a little bit more um, complexity to it. So that way we can exercise yet another layer of objection handling tools in order to remedy it. And it's, it's almost uh, always the easiest way to reverse an objection and get the yes is the layer method. Listen, acknowledge, identify the objection, much in the same way as we do the LARC. But with the layer, we are identifying the objection. So you said you don't want to buy because this house is way too expensive. Is that right? So if I could show you a way to where this house won't be any more money, then this is a conditional close. This reverses a type of conditional. If I can show you a way that I can get you into this house where you're not going to pay any more money than what you would pay if we looked at a smaller, less expensive, less well-featured house, would you be willing to purchase? And then it's just math, right? It's just math. And we know that, you know, um, sometimes a $10,000 raise or a $20,000 raise means absolutely nothing in the long and short of it because $20,000 amortized over a 30-year period, right, is nothing. It'd be different if $10,000 you have to pay off at the end of the year. Now that's real money. But again, if you couple appreciation and equity value um, in every time you're having a conversation with a buyer, then price goes out of the window. And if you're able to break up that price in little small chunks, right? Because we all get scared with a big number. How much is this thing? A million dollars. Oh crap. I'm not going to spend a million dollars. But when you break it down into smaller bite-sized pieces, like how we live our lives, then they're kind of going, oh, well, yeah, I can afford that. Of course you can. 
right? But they get they get uncomfortable or nervous when we tackle um, you know big things all at once. So we're able to just kind of reverse it. And I'm going to use this as a natural stopping point. All right. Can I say something? You, Absolutely, of course. Isn't that going back to listening to what the people are telling you? Because what I found out is a lot of people, they want to need help, but they really don't know what they want. Oh, yeah, I want a four bed and three bath because my brother has one. Well, let me ask you, sir, how many in your family? It's my wife and I and my little boy. Well, are you going to use the other, the other bedroom as an office? Well, uh, uh, oh, I didn't think about that. Why don't we try getting, you know, finding out what you really need. Let's talk to your wife and your son and see what would be the best bet for you. That's exactly it. And you know what you just did, Frank? And I bet you didn't even know you did it. Just you just it. did the feel, felt, found method, right? You, you know, a lot of people feel like they want a four-bedroom house. But, you know, I found that, you know, most home buyers don't actually know what they want. You know, they're buying something because their friend or neighbor or family member may have it. You know, they what do you have? Yeah, and then you provided, you know, the solution, feel, felt, found. I found that, you know, by really kind of talking with the family and getting everybody to align with what's what they really want, we can actually come to a solution. And you're 100% on that. You know, that. The statement of most buyers don't know what they want is 100% true. Whether you're a yes, first sir. time buyer, a move up buyer, a move down buyer, you know, you most often don't know what you want. You know, yep. uh, it's funny because move, um, I'm sorry, replacement home buyers. So they're getting ready to sell their house and they want to buy a new house. And then they get torn between, should we get a bigger house? Cause we had all this equity appreciation or should we get something smaller? Cause we're getting old and we don't move around as well. And you know, all that good stuff. That's a so, perfect example. Yes, sir. I mean, you, you, you were the one who nailed it. That was absolutely yes, great. That's exactly how it happens is, Buyers don't know what they want, and that's really our job is to help them to make an informed decision. Talk about – it's like when you go to the um, uh, home improvement store, like Lowe's or something like that. You're looking for something. You want to do a DIY. You want to do your own uh, uh, DIY, not DIY. Uh, yeah. You want to do, a, I don't know, a new kitchen. You want to talk to somebody who's knowledgeable, who's kind of going, well, you know – you may want to do this, but this stuff doesn't really hold up or this is great, but it may be too much. You know, they help you to make that decision of why you want to buy this. And you leave this, leave the store getting something completely different than what you had in your head. Yes, sir. Excellent example, Frank. That's excellent. That's perfect. Gee, D, can I mention something? Can of I course. Okay. Absolutely. I, you know, I was a realtor 1989 and then basically stayed at home mom and went back to work when Veronica went to college and uh -huh. I had my first buyer and basically it was a, it was thrown at me. They were a nice young couple. They just met and everything. They were living in an apartment and they had me, you know, they wanted to look around for a house. And so they had me go in Valencia, Sagas, Canyon country. And then I kind of got the idea what they wanted. And I go, you guys, let's stop this. And let me show you a couple houses that I think you're really going to like. To them, it was location, location. But when sure. I brought them into the area of where I wanted them to buy and the houses that were there and the schools and everything else that I knew what they were going to have a kids down line. So I bought it. I showed them three houses. They picked one of the houses and they and it was it. And it was like basically instead of running around all over town, Let's see this. Let's see this. Let's see that. I go, let me be the realtor. Let me show you what I think you guys really want and the area that you need to be in with a young family. And that's where you, and basically they bought one of the three houses I showed them. Exactly. That's, that's a great example. I, you know, I do the three house thing as well. Sometimes we paralyze consumers with so much, right? That's why I'm not a fan of the auto drip is because you know, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings who do this, but I'm just going to say it out loud, is it's a lazy way of doing it. I mean, sure, it's a convenience, but unless we have so much business going on and we can't possibly work all the buyers we have, we want to use that auto drip sparingly. Um, you really want to explore with your customer, just as Marcella said, you know, ask a lot of questions. What are you looking for? What is this thing? Well, based on the criteria you told me, I'm going to send you three houses. We're going to look at all three and we're going to make an offer on one. 
part of what we do is help people make decisions. And part of that decision making is actually putting in an offer. I mean, who on this, who in this meeting hasn't spent endless days, weeks, months with a buyer client only to find out they weren't going to buy or they didn't buy from you? And that's because we gave them so much. They had analysis paralysis. They couldn't yep. make a decision because they were like, oh, yeah. oh gosh. Oh. We saw, was that the blue house? No, that wasn't the blue house. The blue house, remember, it had the yellow walls and the funky door. Was that the blue house? Are you sure? And then they end up not doing anything because they just don't remember. Yep. They found somebody to listen to them and got them what they wanted. Yeah, that's exactly what that. And that's what happens. They find, exactly, they find somebody who's going to listen to them and get them what they want. That person who's going to go, no, I hear you. Oh, yeah, no, let's do this. Let me show you this. This sounds yep. more like what you're looking for. Oh, yep. yeah, thank you. Even when I go and buy a pair of pants, sometimes I, I know my size, I know what I want, but sometimes that salesperson who comes up and helps me is absolutely my best friend. It's like, oh, well, no, it sounds like you want these. We just got these in. Is this what you're looking for? <gasps> exactly. You saved me time, convenience, yeah. all the above. You know, you're yep. just thrilled. Yep. It's all about call service. That's all about service. That's it. That's it. A hundred percent of the time. Well, guys, anything else we want to cover? Otherwise, I'll gift you some time back, roughly six minutes. But um, you know, as always, I always appreciate everybody and participation and taking time out of your busy days. Um, definitely, let me know. Send me topics of things that you may want to cover. Um, not only in this session, but in in other sessions, and we'll absolutely get them on calendar for you. Okay, can I just say something really fast? I'm of a course. Listing, I'm a list. I don't really work with buyers all that much, but I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't refuse them. But I'm really having a hard time listing properties right now, especially in my neighborhood. Like right now, as of today, we have like 17 homes for sale in Castell, and I know everybody. I'm talking to mortgage lenders and says. And they're basically saying May 10th, there's going to be a big decision on the feds and everything else. And and basically, uh, the interest rates are supposed to be coming down and stuff. So maybe at that point, people are start listing more homes and stuff. But then uh, I get the objection. What happens if the market crashes? What happens? What happens if the interest rate? What happens? I go, um, well, you know, nobody really has a crystal ball. All I can tell you, if you want to do something now is the time to sell because nobody really knows what the future holds and it goes well where are we going to go what are we going to buy well you tell me what you're looking for and tell me the neighborhood you want i'll go door knock and see if somebody's willing to sell there um, you go so basically that's how i roll with some of the objections that people throw at me but like i said some of the things as i am not an expert i don't have a crystal ball but basically this is what you know you got to do what you got to do so if you want to sell, you should do it now and try to figure out where you want to go. Then we'll find a house that you like. Exactly. And, you know, this is the other thing, too, is that, you know, if we turn it around and give it back to them, which is more about, well, why are you buying? You know, are some of the reasons you want to buy to where you have a place for you and your family or some of the reasons you want to buy because, you know, and finding out why they want to buy. And then that mitigates, you know, what if the market crashes? What if it does? Right, because the market has crashed on at least four of us in this in this meeting uh, a number of times since we started our real estate career, and you know people are still in their houses, people are still yep. eating and feeding their family, people are yep. still driving cars and wearing clothes on their back. So what if it does? You know, we we like we said earlier as we started the call, we will get through the other side. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and we saw it. I saw it back in. Oh seven, oh eight, and ten. I saw it before that with my parents, and we're seeing it again. It happens every 10, 15 years. Real estate gets a little shaky, but times real estate always goes up. I mean, yeah. you know, people can say what they want, but I, I, I don't see how a house that's selling today is cheaper than a house that was selling back in even nineteen eighty. We were right. to buy a house at the prices they were selling for. Oh my God! Okay, so I'm sure you remember sixteen, seventeen percent interest rates. Oh, no, I remember 23%. 1984, when I bought my first house, I was 26 years old. We pay 23% interest rate. Right? Yeah, my, I mean, My parents ahead. paid 16% in 1962, and I thought that was normal. Normal is seven and eight. 
Well, I did. We didn't know that back know, then. Yeah, for sure. No, for sure. Yeah, and and you got to think it was. People will say it was relative to the value of a house. So, like in 1960, you could get a house for fifteen thousand dollars, or actually, you can get a house for less in 1960 because. Average house price in 1970 was about sixteen thousand dollars. Yep, and that's now. But you got to figure, people were making. You know, you had a good salary if you were making five thousand dollars a year in yep. 19 a year in 1970. Yes, it's kind yes, of sir. funny because I was talking to my mom not too long ago, and I was talking about our house. I, I grew up in Colorado, and I was asking about our house, and she was just like, "Oh, I don't know. I paid." And I think I, we were paying close to two hundred dollars a month, and in my brain, in my today brain, I was like, "That's it, two hundred dollars." But that was like a third of the money she made. I, I think it may have been more. I mean, yep. two thousand dollars a year was quite a bit of money to spend on a on a durable fixed uh, fixed item like a house. That was a lot of money, but sure. you know, it's all relative and such right now. Yeah, a loaf of bread with 10 cents. <laughs> uh, 10 cents. And what was gas? Like 13 or 15 cents yeah, or something? 30, like. 39, uh, 19, we came to this country in 1970 and it turned into 71. And it was $39, uh, 39, 39, like 39 dollars a gallon. 39 cents. 39, okay, 39, 39 cents a gallon, right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. It's a lot, boy, have we changed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate everyone's participation. We're coming up on 1 o'clock. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you guys at the next session, and thanks for your participation today. Oh, we appreciate, appreciate you so much. I really do. I appreciate you more than you'll ever know. So thank right you. Right back at Thank you. to you, too. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. See, some of these things...